Welcome guys, today I'm going to show you how I present cases in the ICU. Um, I still remember my first experience in the ICU. Um, in fact, my first call in the, in the hospital was a night call in the ICU. And honestly, I still remember how I felt till today. I literally felt like I wanted to run away because it just makes you, it, because of the overwhelming amount of information, it just makes you feel somehow like, you know, you're just not supposed to be here taking care of these people. You don't know enough. You don't, you don't know what is important, what is not important and things like that. It's just a, a crazy experience for people, you know, encountering that for the first time. I'm sure you probably are able to relate. Um, but over the years, I figured out one of the ways I would be able to survive in the ICU and eventually thrive in the ICU is being able to organize my information in the ways that is most useful uh, for whoever I'm presenting it to, whether it's the attending, my seniors, or even for myself. Uh, and uh, today I'm going to show you how I typically would go about that. So I like to divide them into sections. The initial section that we'll talk about is um, the main you know structure of the information that we're about to present so like every presentation we'll talk about the patient's name patient's name all right we'll then go and mention the age and sex all right and then we'll talk about presenting complaint literally why they're in the hospital and then we'll go ahead and talk about um, just a brief story uh, of how they ended up in the ICU. All right, so just you know, just to kind of make things make sense. And then after that, we'll talk about what investigation has been done so far. Here we mentioned labs and imaging and we're assuming that this is you know a presentation that you're given for the first time that the attending is finding about this patient for the first time so you want to include as many things as possible so they get the, the big picture uh, then after labs and imaging you then talk about uh, the active things uh, you're doing active issues which might also include your initial assessment or the initial assessment of, of whoever admitted that patient. And then you will come to systemic assessment. And then we'll finally go and talk about, because you have to look at all the things that you're doing for the patient, then you talk about your labs, oh, sorry, your orders, your orders, you know, check your orders always and then checklist all right the checklist will be a combination of orders that you're supposed to always put and some other things that will make sure that you know you're not missing uh anything that is important for the patient so these are the initial things that we the initial structure that we use when we're presenting these cases so patient's name age and sex presenting complaint brief story of how they ended up in the icu labs and imaging to give us a sense of what has been done so far uh our active issues and the initial assessment of whoever admitted the patient uh then we'll go on to do our our own systemic assessment. It's always important for ICU patients to do things system-based, as opposed to being on the floor, for example, where you typically would do things, you know, problem list and problem based. But here you typically want to go system-based so you don't miss anything. And then we eventually go and talk about the orders and um, and uh, the checklist. So let's go here now and talk about, look at our systemic assessment. So we'll list it based on the systems. Uh, we can start here. Maybe we should use a different color pen here. So we can start here with uh, neuro. All right. We'll go and then talk about cardio. Uh, you can then go on and talk about respiratory, GI, renal, heme. Uh, let's do endo. ID and finally palliative. I always include palliative, although obviously it's not a, it's not an organ system, but these are the important sections of the patient care that you want to make sure you have proper assessment for and proper plan for. Um, so we'll go ahead and talk about neuro. Again, with each of these systems, if there is an associated diagnosis, that's the first thing you want to mention. All right, mention the diagnosis. 
Um, obviously, for example, with neuro, if they came in with status epilepticus, you can add that there. If they came in with an ischemic stroke, they got mechanical thrombectomy or whatnot, you, you add that with a diagnosis. But then you ask about important information that you need to know about the neuro neurologic system as well. For example, if you need to know their mentation, right? Mental status, you know, are they all, uh, awake, alert, oriented, and how well is that? How can you assess that? You have to be able to mention that just to so get a sense of how the patient is doing. If there's been any imaging, for example, CT head has been done, I want to know about that, so I want to know the findings associated with that. Um, if there are any sedatives, I also want to find that, you know, out in the, in the neurologic system. Um, so these are some of the examples of things you want to include when you're doing your neuro assessment. If you then go into cardio, again, you want to mention the diagnosis, all right? Then you want to mention uh, important things in cardio that we'd want to talk about. For example, in patients with septic shock, um, you want to look at the, what the blood pressure is and uh, you know, the goal. You always want to mention that. Then you also, things that are a bit more peculiar to the cardiovascular system, like evidence of acute ischemia, you know, what does the EKG say? Or even arrhythmias, right? Um, is there troponin elevation? These are important things you want to add here. Uh, sometimes fluid status, you might add it in cardio, but you could also do that in renal. Um, so these are some things I want, to, I want to talk about when I'm talking about my cardiovascular system. Respiratory, you want to mention this, uh, no. Respiratory status, are they saturating adequately on room air? All right, that's super important. You know, if they're not, are they getting any kind of um, uh, ventilatory support? Um, if they're intubated and mechanically ventilated, you obviously want to mention that, all right? Then what are the settings, vent settings here? You can add that as well. You know, what are some of the things that we typically would do for patients that are mechanical ventilated? You do your chest x-ray, you want to mention the findings. There's a debate whether patients are supposed to get, you know, daily chest x-ray or, or, or not. But most of the times you really want to, uh, for patients that are ventilated, you want to do, you know, recurrent chest, frequent chest x-rays at least daily to get a sense of, you know, complications that might be associated with that. Um, things you typically we do for patients that are ventilated as well. Your ABGs, you want to mention that as part of your respiratory assessment. And whatever diagnosis that is associated with that, remember I always, for every system, you also have to mention the diagnosis first. For example, respiratory, if a patient came in with pneumonia, you know, community acquired pneumonia, healthcare associated pneumonia, or even COVID pneumonia, as we've seen, you know, nowadays you literally want to, you know, mention that in the systemic assessment. So here, GI, um, what do we talk about in GI mostly? Uh, again, the diagnosis, right? You want to talk about whether, you know, LFTs is something which, uh, I don't like to call them LFTs, I probably just say liver enzymes. All right, you want to mention here the need for uh, prophylaxis. All right. Um, and you can add whether they're feeding there as well, though we do that mostly in the checklist. But these are some of the things we want to mention when we're talking about GI. With renal, what, what do we want to mention again? If there's any associated diagnosis, you mention that, you know, they're B and creatinine, to mention, you know, whether they have an AKI. Obviously, if there's AKI, that's an additional diagnosis you have to put on there. Um, here, like I said, you can put the fluid status and go, all right? Um, you can add here electrolytes, and then you can also add here um, acid base. Acid base. If there's any acid base disorder, you want to mention that here. And, you know, talk about what you're doing uh, to treat that. Um, moving on, we can then go on and talk about him. With him, um, obviously, if there's any oncology associated diagnosis, you want to add that here as well. I like to put them together, but mostly with him, I want to look at my CBC, what the hemoglobin is, WBC, platelets, if there's any abnormalities associated with that. And like we did with every system, if there's any associated diagnosis, you also want to add that there. Um, with endo, endo obviously like we did everywhere else if there's any associated diagnosis you want to add that um you also want to add the glycemic control meaning what is the sugar looking like and what are you doing to to control that um for most of our septic shock patients we typically would go with a nice sugar trial where we expect the sugar to be within 
140 to 180. And again, the idea is that you don't want to keep them hyperglycemic. Obviously, that's not healthy for them. You also don't want to keep them uh, uh, hyperglycemic at the same time. Uh, moving forward, we we'll talk about ID. ID obviously is not a system, but it's one of the main you know, components of the, our assessment. A lot of patients that would be in medical ICU will be infected by something. Uh, um, a lot of times, septic, septic shock, sepsis patients is what we're treating. So here in ID, you want to ask about, do they have a fever? All right. Is there an elevated white blood cell count? All right. You can add lactate here, which may represent some degree of systemic uh, uh, suffering from sep sepsis or septic shock. Um, here you can also add antibiotics. And here, if you've done any investigation to rule out any uh, source of infection, you also want to add that. Did you do a UA? What did it show? Did you do a chest x-ray to rule out the pneumonia? What did it show? Um, finally, we'll talk about palliative. With palliative, the important thing is to note that with Patients coming to the ICU, obviously these patients are already very critically ill. They're literally just fighting for their lives. And if you don't start that conversation early, it, you just create more problems for yourself because you don't want to be calling the patient's family member when you're in the middle of a code asking, you know, how long should be called for and things like that without having already initiated that discussion. They already have an expectation, you know, warm them up to the reality of things that happen in the ICU. So, as part of your assessment, you have to say what the goals of care is and whether you've been able to reach family or you actually discuss with it. Because not all patients coming to the ICU are knocked out, sedated, and all of that. They, they sometimes are awake and you actually can have that conversation with them. So you always have to add that as part of your systemic assessment just to have a better picture. Um, then we'll go here and talk about, let's go here and talk about our checklist, all right? So what are the, some, uh, some of the components? I, I use the mnemonic fast hog bid. I'm sure some of you have uh, 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 encountered that. Um, so here basically, um, after I've done all these systemic assessment, you know, I'm then talking about things that I shouldn't miss. A lot of them, we already mentioned them here, but doing it twice for a patient that I see doesn't hurt. You're just making sure you're not missing anything. So here, we're going to have the F here for me represents feeding. Am I feeding the patient? Is the patient MPO for? In fact, it's always advised that there is, except there is a contraindication to feeding, you should never have a patient in the ICU, you know, uh, MPO. It's, it's just part of their recovery requires, you know, nutrients, you know, caloric uh, requirements. And if you're not doing that, you're treating everything else, you don't expect them to get better. So you should always have some form of feeding, um, except there's a clear contraindication to feeding. Uh, so you have to talk about that here. Uh, another thing that F represents for me is the fluids. You know, already I talked about in Reno, but you could also add that here as well. Here we're going to talk about analgesia. Analgesia. Um, I like to put these two together, analgesia and sedatives, because a lot of times for patients uh, that are in the ICU, some of their analgesic medications tend to also cover as their sedatives, at least minor sedative properties that they have. Um, for Again, for example, for patients that are mechanically ventilated, you should at least keep them calm. And one of the ways you do that is to have some pain control. But most of those pain medications also cover uh, uh, some degree of sedation. In fact, the recommendation is that for patients that are mechanically ventilated that don't have any other indication for sedatives, you should just focus on using opioid sedatives, all right? Opioid sedatives, because they have the least deliriogenic effects. So you typically would have patients that are on opioids as sedatives that also covers, you know, uh, as, as pain control. If those kind of patients that are mechanically ventilated now are not properly sed uh, uh, kept calm, with the uh, opioid sedative, then you can add some of the garbanergic ones. And these ones are purely sed uh, sedatives because they don't have the analgesic properties. So the garbanergic ones, for example, you have the propofol. Obviously in your senses, these things might differ, but this is what I'm most familiar with. You have your propofol or you have your midazolam. All right, so these ones have more deliriogenic effects and particularly the benzodiazepine here has the more 
the more uh, deliriogenic effects. So I typically try to avoid that, especially for patients that are older, uh, uh, especially if they don't have any other indication for it. If you have a patient with status epilepticus, for example, that's a clear indication for these drugs, propofol or midazolam. So you might want to use them as even first line. Fentanyl and the opioid sedative is not really going to do anything for you there. Um, so these are some of the sedatives that we use, and obviously there's more of them. Uh, one that I would also try to avoid by all means is the lorazepam infusion infusion that's you know uh, the the adivan infusion that would possibly cause um, uh, propylene glycol um, toxicity so the sedatives you want to mention them and you want to mention your goal as well you can talk about the ras core here you look it up if you don't know what that is um, t here represents for me thromboprophylaxis Thromboprophylaxis. Thromboprophylaxis basically should include two things. One of them is the sequential compression device if they have the limbs that can take that. And in addition to a, you know, pharmacotherapy here, we're going to list low molecular weight heparin. Uh, although unfractionated heparin is another option, but Comparing in patients with GFR above 30, comparing low molecular weight heparin and unfractionated heparin, these guys, low molecular weight heparin, have least amount of bleeding complications and all of that. So I prefer that. Uh, but for patients with end stage renal disease, you know, you may not be able to metabolize this one, so you go ahead and use your unfractionated heparin. But there has to be two uh, uh, SCD and uh, uh, low molecular weight heparin. The H here basically represents the head of bed. Uh, 30 degrees and this is mainly to prevent ventilator associated pneumonia because this is another hospital associated uh, problem that you want to avoid is a negative ding on any ICU and I'm sure your attendees might have gotten on your case if that wasn't seen when they're in the ICU. Um, so the U here represents stress ulcer prophylaxis. Stress ulcer prophylaxis. All right, uh, the two main ones we consider are the PPIs and the H2 blockers. We always try to make choose one based on the side effect profile, but the truth is for both of them, the side effect profile is pretty similar. Um, but in terms of prevention of bleeding associated with stress ulcer, PPI tends to edge H2 blockers. But you also have to have in mind the risk of you know, nephrotic syndrome and glomerulonephropathy associated with PPIs. So that's more, more recent information. But again, if, if be mindful that these things can affect the kidney. So if you're using them, yeah, be, keep an eye on them. But you know, to really prevent the bleeding associated with stress, also PPIs edge H2 blockers. But it doesn't, it doesn't hurt using H2 blockers as well. And the indication for stress also prophylaxis will be patients that are mechanical ventilated more than 48 hours, patients, um, a risk of stress ulcers, you know, whether it's burns or patient with uh, intracranial, um, increased intracranial pressure, and some relative indication will be patient on steroids and with uh, uh, coagulopathies, all right? But two clear indications will be mechanically ventilated patients and patients with risk of stress ulcers. G here represents glycemic control. Talk about what you're doing, again, for most of our septic, septic shock patients, nice trial, 140 to 180 is the goal. B here would represent the bowel movement. I talk about bowel and bladder here. Bowel and bladder, are they making any bowel movement? If they're not, because you know when they're not able to empty their bowels, it affects a mechanics that allows proper ventilation and you want to avoid anything that compromises your ventilation, you, you, you want to give them a bowel regimen. If they're feeding, right and you expect them to be making bowel movement if they're not you have the bowel regimen you have to institute that most of what we will use will uh, for example your senna 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 cord your miralax polyethylene glycol and uh, the doclas colis and all of these ones you can combine them just to be able to achieve whatever it is you have to achieve um bladder you also want to make sure they're making urine all right if they're not making urine you might have to put a catheter in there Ooh, that's espn now the eye here represents the indwelling catheters. Ooh, this is a big, massive, massive one you have to check because of the risk of clapsies and cortes. 
collapse is a central line associated bloodstream infection, cut is a catheter associated urinary tract infection. All of these things, you know, they're, they're scores that ICs and hospitals are judged by. And if you mess up, if your attendant comes and you cause any of these ones because you didn't do this checklist and remove what you didn't need, ah, that's usually a big problem for, for anyone in that situation. But again, um, with the central lines, it's basically remove them when you don't need them. So a patient comes in with septic shock, all right? They're no longer in shock, all right? They're no longer on pressors. You don't have any use for the central line, remove it right there. For most central lines, it would be permissible to use them for at least seven days. But for femoral lines, because of the area and the risk of infection higher in that, that one is basically remove it the moment you're able to get an IJ or a scopoclavian. But if it's a scopoclavian or an IJ, it can last for at least you know, seven days. Uh, but again, it doesn't, you don't have to wait for seven days. The moment you stop needing it, take it out. Uh, recording is the same thing, Foley's. Usually we use Foley's to measure you know, urine output in critically ill patients or patients that can't make urine uh, uh, by themselves, maybe from some urinary obstruction. But the moment they're able to make urine without that, take out the Foley because you're trying to prevent these guys. These guys are bad, not just for the hospital. Don't, don't get me wrong, for the patient themselves, because if they're getting an infection, the mortality associated with septic, septic shock is, you know, significant. If they're getting an infection because of something you forgot to do, that's not good, and you have to make sure to avoid that. The same thing with the Foley. Finally, with the D, D here represent de-escalation of antibiotics. So you have a lot of patients, obviously, in medical IC, we treat a lot of sepsis, septic shock patients. They come in, you do the initial, your sepsis bundle, you give them antibiotics, Initially, broad spectrum antibiotics after you've taken your blood culture samples. Now, one day or two, day late, two days later, you're getting the results of the blood culture that's telling you it's the particular organism. So whatever extra antibiotics that you're giving them that they, do not, they no longer need, maybe you're giving them some, for something for gram positive and now they're growing gram negative, you don't need that gram positive coverage again. You have to take it out, de-escalate as much as you can. Uh, and, you know, if you present your information like this, you literally have nothing else you're missing that is usually very important. Again, some attendants prevent, prefer short, shorter presentation, but it means that if you're gonna streamline and give just the most important information, even if they ask you something that you, you know, you need to know, you have that. You have that information because you've already done this as part of your own, you're coming in the morning, you're checking your patients and making this list for, for the patients that you're taking care of. So that's it. I appreciate you guys for watching and staying this long. Um, if you have any comments, questions, or thoughts, leave them in the comment section below. You can find me on Instagram at FatiMD underscore or The Residence Cove. Uh, those are the two accounts that I use on Instagram. We have daily uh, flashcards that we post to help you just keep up with the information that's required for residency. Um, again, I appreciate all of you guys for watching. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.